So when a man or woman of God falls from grace or has a moral failure, what do we do? Do we protect them at all costs because they are God's anointed and they can do no wrong? Or do we throw them out and throw out everything they have ever said and done because clearly their current sin is proof of a history of bad character? How do we handle scandal in context? Let's talk about it. Hey, welcome back to In Context. Today, we are talking about the most recent allegations of uh, Mike Bickle, founder and leader of International House of Prayer in Kansas City. I'm looking at an article here from Christianity Today that was uh, published recently, and it says this, Mike Bickle, the founder of the International House of Prayer of Kansas City, is facing allegations of sexual and spiritual abuse spanning decades and involving multiple women. Bickle, who is 68, has been accused of sexual misconduct where the marriage covenant was not honored, according to a statement released from a group of former IHOP KC leaders who have investigated the claims. So looking at this public statement um, by those leaders, uh, let's just read through it. So it says a few days ago, we made the leadership team of the International House of Prayer in Kansas City aware of serious allegations spanning several decades concerning its founder, Mike Bickle. Without going into details to protect the privacy of the victim's identities, we have found these allegations of clergy sexual abuse by Mike Bickle to be credible and long-standing. The credibility of these allegations is not based on any one experience or any one victim, but on the collective and corroborating testimony of the experiences of several victims. I mean, right away, I'm just curious, like, how many victims there are, how many of these victims are known maybe by these former leaders. Um, It's also interesting that these allegations came from former leaders instead of current leaders. Um, So uh, I wonder if there was a feeling of a lack of safety even to go to current leaders outside or around Mike Bickle. Um, It's just interesting that they went to former leaders. Um, So continuing, it says prior to the meeting with the leadership team of IHOP, We attempted to bring the allegations and the testimony of one of the victims directly to Mike Bickle in the spirit of Matthew 18, 15 through 17. So Matthew 18 uh, is about dealing with sin in the church. And it says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen, then take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, then you tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, then treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So it seems like the leaders are saying they tried to go to Mike directly, um, according to Matthew 18. And it says they were repeatedly rebuffed by Mike Bickle and were refused any sort of meeting. Instead, Mike used manipulating and intimidating tactics towards the victims to isolate them and discredit them. To avoid further wounding of the victims, we met with several members of IHOP KC's executive leadership team. Okay, so this is former leaders now meeting with current leaders, executive leaders um, of IHOP KC. And it says there they shared testimonies of these victims of Mike's inappropriate words and actions. Now, it says when these allegations were brought to our attention, we were shocked. We could never have imagined that inappropriate conduct with women as something we would ever need to be concerned about. These allegations seemed out of character to the man we thought we knew, but they were so serious that we could not ignore them. So honestly, by these leaders even saying this is something that they could not have expected from Mike and that based on their history, their relationship and their understanding of his character, that this seems so far off base. I would imagine that these leaders don't have any ill will towards Mike. And again, I don't know. None of us know. But I would imagine they're, they're not using language like and since we left IHOP KC and we knew who Mike was when we left, this is just confirming everything or validate like none of that language is being used. They're saying this is the furthest thing that we would have ever expected from IHOP and especially from Mike. And so for me, just speculating, I mean, it it seems to put this uh, information 
in a more objective standpoint than it could be in. It could be in a place of, hey, we just don't trust Mike and we've been left the church and we've been left IHOP because of this. This makes this information a lot less subjective um, and I think adds a little more value to uh, the allegations that we're reading. But let's continue. We're almost we're about halfway through. It says the scriptures inform us that leaders in the church, especially those who teach the word of God, are held to a higher standard and stricter judgment. And yeah, that can be found in the book of James. We believe that Mike Bickle's actions were not above reproach and fall short of biblical standards for leaders in the church. To be clear, the allegations made about Mike Bickle's misconduct were sexual in nature where the marriage covenant was not honored. Furthermore, the allegations made also reveal that Mike Bickle used his position of spiritual authority over the victims to manipulate them. We do not share this process to fill in salacious details, but to protect the integrity of the victims and their experiences that were shared. Um, I appreciate how this team is going about it based off of this letter. Again, we don't know what has happened. We don't know if this is um, just a quarter of the story or half the story or the whole story. We know that there is more to it. Um, but from what we're reading, um, it does seem that these former leaders are trying to um, protect these victims, potential victims of what happened um, and how they went about handling it um, without the intent to expose or assassinate character but that they tried to do it as biblically as they could and as they understood at the time um, they appeal uh, to those who know what's happening to refrain from using the name of any victims because these are women who have always been viewed as credible trustworthy and courageous okay meaning that they know the victims and that none of these victims had any intention to punish mike bickle and that they had nothing to gain by sharing their experience except for a pursuit of truth repentance mercy and grace that letter is full <laughs> that is full of information um i think as we saw it is allegations which means there's a lot to unpack and probably more that will come and unfold but again before we get into uh mike did this and ihop kc isn't credible anymore i think we have to slow down i think we need to assess this in context and so I want to look at the life of Paul first. I want to look at Romans chapter 7, 19, because in this place, we read a little bit about Paul, who is the apostle. <laughs> like if there is one apostle that seems to stand above the rest, just reading the gospels, reading the New Testament, it's Paul, not because he's better, not because he is more righteous, but because one, he wrote so much in the New Testament and he has had such an encounter with Jesus, um, not being necessarily in the same position as the other apostles who followed Jesus from ignorance. He came to follow Jesus after he was killing Christians, after he was persecuting, chasing them, pr imprisoning them, doing all the things uh, that he could. So Paul tells us about his struggle with sin in Romans chapter seven. And he says, I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is, what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I've discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. And this power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Now. I don't share that verse um, to say, hey, Mike had something within him, uh, perhaps that made him make these decisions. I'm sharing that for the context of Paul, who is this great teacher, is telling us, hey, guys, I struggle with sin. I am a spiritual father to many of you. I'm writing these letters that he probably didn't know at the time would be canonized, but that he believed to be true encounters and out of true relationship and conversation with Jesus. And I think what this passage tells us that no matter how great you are as a believer or a leader, failure is inevitable. And I really don't care what part of the Bible that you open up to. You are going to open up to someone's failure and someone's disappointment. And I tell you what, it's not God who failed. So you can open it up in Genesis and read Adam and Eve taking over fruit that they were told not to. 
uh, Abraham lying to kings about whether Sarah was his wife or his sister because of fear and protection of his own life. Uh, David and Bathsheba, who's probably really relevant, a really relevant example to this conversation, a king who succumbed to lust in his heart and made very terrible decisions, murder being one of them, um, an assertion of his kingly position on a woman in order to uh, sleep with her and eventually marry her um, as his wife. So I think we can land on the fact that failure is inevitable. And what that should mean for you and for me is that whenever there are falls, whenever there is scandal, whenever there are leaders, whether they're men or women, pastors, ministers, prophets, whatever, when they fall, it should not shake our faith to the point that we begin to question Jesus and his goodness. Because, again, while these are allegations, if this turns out to be true and you are now in the place of questioning your faith, let's say you followed Mike very closely and that uh, whether from close proximity or from afar, he was a discipler to you. This still should not have you questioning your faithfulness to Jesus, because if it is, I have some news for you. You have idolized Mike Bickle. And if you've idolized him, you've probably idolized some other men and women of God as well. You've elevated him to a position that only God should hold in your life. And I urge you to please assess yourself because many times as Christians, we all have made this mistake. Um, one person that I can remember in my own life, Ravi Zacharias, probably the most prolific and well-known apologist of our time. Uh, Ravi Zacharias was, um, as far as we knew, a great man who defended the faith, wrote many books. And then after his death, all of this information comes out about him sexually uh, being involved with women outside of the marriage bed. So you have fornication, you have adultery there. And for those of us who read his books, uh, saw him live on college campuses, uh, responding and going toe to toe with atheist philosophers, agnostic philosophers, and honestly, arguing them into a chokehold because of his uh, awareness and understanding of both God, his creation and his scripture. Having seen all of that and then hearing this news, I was greatly disheartened. I had friends. I had uh, previous classmates who we were shaken. But what we landed on is Romans 3, 3, which says, what if some did not have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? Certainly not. Let God be true and let every man be a liar. What does that mean? If every man or woman that you follow in this faith turns out to be a liar, they cannot nullify the faithfulness of Christ. They cannot take away what God has done on the cross and is still doing in your life. So let every other man be a liar. They do not speak for the faith in its entirety. They, like every single one of us, hope to be a successful diplomat of the kingdom, a successful representation of Jesus. So what should we do in response? I think one, we have to start with the fact that Psalm 89 and 14 tells us that righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. What does that mean? God is not going to let unrighteousness rule his church. He is not going to allow uh, people to sin and manipulate and allow them to get away with it. Um, as the, the leaders wrote in their letters, teachers are held to a higher standard. James 3 and 1 tells us, do not urge yourself to become a teacher because you are judged more harshly. And so knowing that God is going to take care, he says vengeance is his. What's our role? Well, our role would be to grieve with the victims. If anyone has ever been manipulated or um, groomed or sexually assaulted by someone who carries the name of Christ, grief, shared disappointment, anger, all of that is the, the role of us as the church. Now, man, remember, we're to be angry and to not. We have to walk with accountability because none of us are exempt from the struggles and the temptation of sin. Not one of us. All of us have struggled with some form of sin. Many of us, it's lust. Some of us, it's alcoholism. Some of us, it's addiction. Some of us, it, it, it is just the fact that we are so puffed up with pride about who we think we are and that, hey, I would never do what Mike did. Guess what? You're already in sin. You're already doing what Mike did. Your sin may look different because here's the thing. Failure also varies. Like for some of the heroes of the faith, 
failure looked like uh, sexually assaulting someone. For some people, it looked like murdering someone. Moses murdered someone. David murdered someone. For Abraham, it looked like lying. But guess what? They're all failures in the eyes of God. So we must walk with accountability. Because here's the thing, at in context, I am not under the persuasion that we protect the Lord's anointed at any cost. We don't protect them at the expense of others, and we don't protect them at the expense of God's word. Simultaneously, because here we stay in context, we should be praying for Mike Bickle's repentance and his restoration. If this turns out to be true, our prayer should be that he would repent of his sin and that he would take the discipline that he would take the consequences, that he would do his due diligence to make it right, to do as much justice as he can and allow himself to be put into whatever space of restoration that the ministry allows if they allow it. Because the ministry may not. They may say, hey, you can never be a part of this ministry again because of the hurt that you've caused. And that has happened before. And then Mike will have to pick up the pieces, go to the Lord and entrust him for what is next in his life. So now looking at the life of David, and some of the mistakes that he made, um, in particular, uh, his moral failure concerning lust and sexual misconduct. David should have been at war with the men in his army. But instead, for whatever reason, he stayed back in the palace. And while looking over his kingdom, he saw a woman bathing and he fell in love with her beauty. He went after her and invited her to the palace, sent a servant and slept with her. He invited that man back and tried to get him drunk because David had impregnated this woman. And David tried to get this man to get drunk and go sleep with the woman so that he could claim David's child as his own. David tried to clean up his own mess, but David had gone too far. And the man was like, no, I'm going to be more faithful to the army than my king. And he refused to go home and sleep in his own bed. And so David ended up having this man murdered. So with David doing all of these things, What can we learn? Well, one, the prophet Nathan gleaned all of this either from the spirit of God as well as members of the palace. But the point is he had the information about what David had done, yet he did not recklessly confront David. He did so with care and he did so with caution and he allowed God to convict David of his wrongdoing. So I think it's always helpful, especially at this stage where we only have allegations that we approach judgment carefully. If more evidence comes out, then, hey, now we can take another step in our discernment and our judgment. However, at this point, I think we should approach it carefully. If someone, a prophet who knew the truth, still approached David with care, we should probably approach the situation carefully. Number two, I think that we learn that failure isn't fatal. And contrary to what many of us want to believe about men and women who make a mockery of God or fall to their sin, failure is not fatal. Not necessarily. David was restored. David had consequences for his sins. He paid those consequences. But because he was a man after God's own heart and he set in the pain of his decision, he was able to be restored. So we have to remember that we live by God's standards not the standards of men. So we cannot simply throw any person away. We can't throw Mike Bickle away and label him a heretic and burn every one of his books because here's the thing. There has been so much fruit off of the ministry of IHOP. There's been so much fruit out of the life of Mike Bickle. And if you decide that you want to throw Mike Bickle away and label him a heretic, you're going to have to throw away the entire book of Psalms and label David a heretic as well. Because David did everything that Mike Bickle has been accused of and then some. So I think we don't have the right as much as the hurt and the anger and the disappointment that fuels our feelings in this moment. Again, if it's true, we don't have the right to dismiss the work that Christ did through men or women who have fallen. We simply do not. We can't say, oh, well, none of it was real. None of the lives that were saved at one thing conferences or in the prayer room, all those hours of 24 seven prayer for for the last years, decades, that none of that counts. It's not our place. It's simply not our place as believers. There's no biblical precedent for it. I think we have to remember that Jesus doesn't love Mike Bickle more than he loves the victims, nor does he love the victims more than he loves Mike Bickle. He loves them both and he's invested in them both the same. 
that they be formed into the likeness of his son. So let's be slow to judge. All we have now is accusations and allegations. Let's pray. Let's discern and let's wait and let's see what's revealed. And let's check back in as we continue to strive to live in context. Thanks so much for tuning in. Talk to you next time. Hey, I'm so glad that you stuck around to the end of this video because there is something that I want to share with you. When I first started this channel, I felt like I heard the Lord say pretty clearly, James, what's not going to happen is people are not going to click on videos, watch your face all day and not get a moment to get to know who I am. And so when he said that, that made it very clear to me that I needed to share the truth about who God is at the end of every single video. And so if you don't know who God is, if you have never experienced the truth of who Jesus is, I want to share some good news with you. I'm not sure what brought you to my channel. I don't know what made you click on one of these videos, but I do know this. If you are watching this video, then God does have a plan for your life. And it begins with you believing in him. Well, James, why do I have to believe in him? Because Romans 3.23 tells us this, that every person alive has sinned and has fallen short of the glory of God. That means that no matter who you are, if you are alive, if you have ever breathed breath, then you have sinned. You have disappointed God and you have fallen short of the call that he has on your life. So what does that mean? Where, where do we go from there? Well, we begin by acknowledging that truth. We acknowledge that we sin. I think if we're all honest that if you've ever had wonderings about is there a God, you know you've disappointed him. You know that there's a God-sized hole in your heart that you probably tried to fill with a thousand other things, people, addictions, whatever it is. But here's the thing, Romans 6 and 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. It's like when you commit a crime, either you get a ticket and you gotta pay a fine, or you get arrested and go to jail. Either way, you have to pay when a crime is committed. In the same way, when we sin, there is a price that is owed to God. And according to scripture, that price is a life. But here's the good news. Romans 5 and 8 tells us this, that Christ died for us even while we were sinning. So while you were still sinning, he died for you. He didn't wait for you to stop. He didn't wait for you to get clean because I know some of us think, man, I got to get perfect before I can go to church. I got to get myself together before I can go to God. He already died for you, even in your worst possible state. So now you're probably thinking, James, if Christ has already died for me in my worst possible state and the debt that I owed has already been paid in full, then why are we having this conversation? Because relationships aren't one way. It's like when you order something from Amazon and they drop it off on your porch, you don't have what you ordered yet until you go outside, pick up the package and open it up. In the same way, Christ has already committed everything to you, but if you don't open up the package and the gift that he has given you and receive it, then it doesn't apply to you. Because his gift of salvation, his gift of saving you and rescuing you from your sins, while it is free and there's nothing you can do to earn it, it's just a gift that he gives you because he loves you. You still have to receive it. You still have to say, okay, this is mine and it applies to me. Well, how do we do that? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if we declare with our mouths, if you say it out loud, that Jesus is Lord, that he's the Lord of your life. And if you believe in your heart that his father God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. That is the way that you know for sure that you have been saved. So I want you to take a moment and I want you to consider the things that I've said, and I want you to really quiz your heart. Have I really opened up the gift that Christ has given me? Because some of you know Christ. Some of you have sat in church your whole life, but that's not opening up the gift. Having a Bible is not opening up the gift. You actually have to say the words, Jesus is Lord, and you have to believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead for your sake. See, the price was death, but because Christ lived a sinless life, God actually raised him from the dead three days later. So if you believe that, if you've made that decision, if you considered what I said and you said, hey, I believe I received the gift that Christ gave for me, then you just made the best decision of your life. And I don't want you to do life alone. So what I want you to do is go into the comments and I want you to say, I accepted or I received or I said yes to Jesus. And by doing that one, that gives me the opportunity to number one, celebrate you. 
We want to celebrate you as you join the family of Christ. Number two, it allows me to pray for you. This is my commitment to anyone who comments that they received Christ. I am going to pray for you by name. I'm going to take time out of my day and pray for you because I believe that the work that Christ is starting in your heart, he's going to complete it. And this is only the beginning. And number three, I actually want to get you connected with some good resources that will help you grow in your journey to knowing God. So I appreciate you taking some time to hear some good news that I had to share with you. And I can't wait to see you on the next video.